Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Changing Landscape of Sexual Health and STIs in the U.S. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Roche Diagnostics. To learn more, visit diagnostics.roche.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Patricia J. Kissinger, Professor, Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Casey N. Pinto, Nurse Practitioner, PA Department of Health, STD Clinic and Infectious Disease Associates, and Assistant Professor, Public Health Sciences, Penn State Cancer Institute. And David T. Pride, Associate Professor of Pathology, Director of Molecular Microbiology, Associate Director of Microbiology, University of California, San Diego. Patty, Casey, and David, you may now begin your presentation. Hi everyone, and welcome to my section of the presentation. My name is Casey Pinto, and I'm here to talk to you about kind of the real life lived experiences or what providers on the ground are seeing during COVID and up to now. So first, I'd like to refresh us all on what happened in um, March of 2020, because even though it was only two years ago, it seems like so much longer. But essentially what happened for our state health centers, um, our STD clinics that are staffed by DIS officers, is that we saw a large majority of them being redeployed to not just fight coronavirus, but really to do contact tracing. We saw our clinics shut down as we decided how to move forward. Most places moved to telehealth. Because of this, these changes, Barbie's group came out with these clinical guidelines for sexually transmitted infections. Um, the four main takeaways, and while this, you know, obviously with 100% care or best practice, these aren't the best recommendations, but during COVID, these were the best recommendations that would keep people safe from COVID while also doing our best to treat STIs. So, we were deferring STI screening visits. So these are your patients who just came in routinely to get screened. We were treating persons with known exposure via telephone and telemed with oral medications, um, which we all know isn't the best for syphilis and chlamydia, or sorry, syphilis and gonorrhea, um, but it was something we had to decide to do at this point in time um, to kind of prevent exposure to COVID. We were triaging patients with symptoms using telemed, and we were continuing to provide in-person clinical care for select patients with symptoms. So those that you really couldn't make a diagnosis over the phone, and although these were the best practices, many clinics were not adhering to this um, simply due to physical constraints, other issues going on, um, and the inability to see patients in the office. Specifically, this really impacted the STD field, uh, like the, the STD state health centers. Um, and this report from the National Coalition of STD Directors from May of 2020 really starts to outline that 83% of programs were deferring services or field visits. 62% couldn't maintain their HIV and syphilis caseloads, which I know, and I'm sure Dr. Kissinger is gonna talk about syphilis um, and, and the results of that. As, as a piece of the result of this. 66% of clinics reported a decrease in sexual health screening. 60% of clinics were at reduced capacity. 57% reported that they or other DIS have been redeployed to COVID-19. So easily over half of every STD state health center um, that was in this poll reported a decrease in services, and our STD services are already stretched to the max. Um, and this was a positive thing that we actually have the ability to perform field visits remotely and virtually, but only 32% of them had that. 
I'd love to see an update on where this is, but it's not present. So right now, the, the majority, 41.79% had to reduce services by more than 50%, and, and less than 20% did not have to reduce any sexual health testing as of May 2020. Now, has it reduced clinic capacity? Again, only 40% had no changes to STD clinic capacity, while the other 60-ish percent had something to some extent of um, clinic capacity reduction. And I love pointing this out because we talk about STI testing as one of the mainstays of service. And what you see here is the number of tests done by Quest Diagnostics since January of 2019 until June, well, it's actually August of 2020. So when you look across, you see your normal blips for Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, and then you see this huge tank once the U.S. did their COVID shutdown. And I think that's really important because this isn't telling you how many people are testing positive. This is telling you how many people are getting tested. And there's a huge 60% drop in the number of people that are tested, but the positivity rate per test went up simply because we suspect that symptomatic people were getting tested at that point in time. And this is chlamydia and gonorrhea by volume. And of course those tests are hand in hand, right? Cause they're the urine gnat. So the majority of the time you're gonna see an equal number. And then if you look at the actual and anticipated chlamydia positive, as of June 21st, we were still below our expected chlamydia positivity rate. But if you look at gonorrhea, you see that that has skyrocketed. And we'll talk a little bit about why perhaps the chlamydia rate hasn't come up. And I know that Dr. Kissinger will likely talk about that as well in her talk. So I'll try not to bleaker it. But the National Coalition of STD Directors increased, uh, sorry, they redid the report in January of 2021. And what they found was that 90% of these STD um, health centers, because remember, all of our DIS officers, the majority of DIS officers in the US are for STD. We do have other diseases where they do contact tracing, but the majority are working on STD as some aspect of their workload. And 90% were doing COVID-19 contact tracing. 37% as of January 2021, were redeployed. 87% are leading, staffing, assisting, or supporting COVID-19. COVID-19 redeployments were interfering with their ability to provide disease intervention, including a 28% decrease in chlamydia, a 23% decrease in syphilis services, and an 18% decrease in gonorrhea services. Um, while I think chlamydia and gonorrhea are incredibly important and should be, I think when Dr. Kissinger talks you'll see why this 23% decrease in syphilis services may have had a huge impact on current STI rates. Oops, sorry, I'm clicking too much. So for me, a little bit about me, I am an infectious disease nurse practitioner, but I also work in the city of York STI clinic uh, in their sexual wellness clinic. So I'm there one day a week, I see patients there. Pre-pandemic, we had a walk-in from you know, we say it's 10 to 2.30, but really it's like nine to five. So when the patients stop coming, I stop seeing patients. We were really busy and we had about a 20% positivity rate. So really high rate before the pandemic. Pandemic hit, we had to shut down because we only had two DIS officers and they both got redeployed to COVID and were essentially not functioning in the role of STD. We slowly started to reopen and then COVID surged again and we had to shut down again. Um, which was problematic because people had started coming. So now we're opening. We opened again. We've been open for several months, but we decided not to do walk-in yet until we see what's really going to happen with the pandemic. So right now I'm seeing scheduled appointments only, which impacts the number of patients I see because most people want to walk in. They don't want to schedule an appointment and I'm seeing a lot of no-shows, but the patients I am seeing, I'm seeing a high rate of syphilis, much higher than I've ever expected. I've done more dark field microscopy exams um, than ever, which I know is not the norm, but it's something I was trained on, so I'm lucky enough to have in the office. 
So I get to do those. I've diagnosed several syphilis cases just with Darkfield. Obviously, we sent it out for testing to confirm, but I was able to increase uh, partner notification or start partner notification earlier, which is the only reason why I do Darkfield. Um, so syphilis is really what I've been seeing a lot of. Our positivity rate is much higher than it was even before. So we're at like 30% right now. And that's because patients are coming in who've been told that they were positive by someone else patients who are symptomatic, we're getting a much smaller number of patients who um, are just coming for routine screening. And I don't know if it's because they've just decided not to come or if they're seeking care elsewhere. Now, while I don't practice in the emergency room or, or an OB-GYN, I've received more calls this year from uh, colleagues in the ER or urgent care asking how to treat patients for diseases that I'm surprised that they're even screening for. So one of the cases we saw was a patient had a positive mycoplasma genitalium and they their provider who screened for it had no idea what to do. So they sent them to the ER. So I get a call from the ER, what do I do? I feel like this doesn't need to be in the ER. And I'm like, no, you're right, it doesn't. Um, so we treated for that. I'm seeing a much higher rate of calls for interpreting syphilis results. So patients are being screened, they're positive, they're positive two months ago, the titer did not decrease at all, and they don't know what to do. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of calls for syphilis for that. Overall, I've received maybe one call a week, and I'm up to probably five to six calls a week from urgent care alone. And then OB, you know, I really never get, I have never received calls from the OB groups ever. Um, but I think the issue with this increase of syphilis that we're seeing in our practice is they're catching more in OB. So they're trying to figure out next steps. For a while, there was a bicillin shortage and we couldn't treat them. It was a mess that I'm sure you guys are also dealing with. Um, the other thing I'm seeing is resistant trick which we didn't know was resistant or not. And you can't send for testing because the CDC is currently not doing resistant trick testing. Um, so, you know, we had to work with some of our colleagues to get these specimens shipped out to get them tested in a research lab to see if it's resistant to trick. Um, so a lot of things coming up that I haven't seen before, which makes me really concerned about what's gonna come up when we really get back into testing completely. And I'll talk about that now, because I think this is really important to talk about. As a lot of these places transition to telehealth, they're sending patients to do urine screenings um, or get blood tests at labs, and they're not coming in. So, you know, a women's routine health visit pre-pandemic, and this, I picked women 21 to 29, because if you're going for cervical cancer screening at 25 to 29, you should also be getting at least at one point in time, chlamydia and gonorrhea screening. And this is asymptomatic. And I know we pick up a lot at these, but what you saw was in 2019, you had this like nice stable trend, but in 2020, it went from boop to no screening to, and we still weren't at baseline in September. So what likely will happen is all these women or you know, trans women or whoever, all these people were getting screened and that got pushed off. Um, and it unfortunately got pushed off for who knows how long, because we haven't seen a follow-up to this, but that also means that the routine screening was also pushed off. And now because of what I do, I really needed to talk on rural urban disparities because I think it's really important. There is literally nothing in the literature right now about STI rates during COVID um, in rural versus urban populations. So if anyone's out there that's a researcher, that now's the time to do it. I know from talking to colleagues in Alaska and other states that, you know, using things like I want the kit has really improved access for some patients. But overall, the biggest barrier for rural health is access to care. So there are all these other disparities, but the biggest barrier is access to care. So negative thing is, according to this report, the impact of COVID-19, financial status of many rural hospitals are perilously on the precipice of closing. So we may be losing one of our biggest access points to care. But on the other hand, we're seeing a rapid scale up of telehealth during COVID-19 um, with subsequent implications. And this is just subspecialty care, 
But I think with the advent and acceptance of this that we may be seeing more. So that's my end. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kissinger. And now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Patty Kissinger. Thanks so much, Dr. Pinto. My name is Dr. Patty Kissinger. I'm here to talk to you about the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on sexually transmitted infection care. Where do we go from here? So Dr. Pinto did a great description of all the challenges that she as a clinician has seen in the field uh, with respect to uh, restrictions that were imposed because of COVID-19. And I wanna go in, into a little bit um, of what we can do and what lessons we've learned. So as she mentioned, there's, there was a dramatic reduction in STI screening, and that was for many reasons. Um, the restrictions of the shutdowns of the clinics, the clinics were being diverted and were be re being required to take care of many more COVID patients. Uh, in addition to that, there was issues with sourcing of, a, of materials and equipment. Uh, urine cups were hard to come by. Dacron swabs are hard to come by. So uh, the... There, it was a confluence of many different things that uh, resulted in many less people getting screened for sexually transmitted infections. So we do, did see, despite the fact that so few people or fewer people were being screened, we did see a rebound of many more, much more syphilis that was going on. And you can see here from this graph uh, in 2020, uh, that the rates were as high as early 90s when we were seeing one of the highest rates of syphilis uh, historically. And so all of the great interventions that had been done prior to the COVID pandemic uh, were kind of refuted by this uh, or negated by uh, this pandemic. And so uh, you will see probably the STIs that are traditionally are more symptomatic, you'll probably see higher rates of those. The ones that are, tend to be less symptomatic, such as chlamydia, you're going to see less rates because less, fewer people have been uh, tested. And as, as Dr. Pinto mentioned, the use of televisits, which was actually, we were starting, uh, you know, health uh, care was starting to use televisits to access populations that had, heart, had difficulty in, in accessing normal care, they would use televisits such as rural communities um, and other communities that, uh, such as underrepresented communities that did not necessarily go into clinics. So the use of televisits uh, was amplified greatly during COVID. And I, I think it's here to stay. I think that um, patients like it, providers like it for the most part, um, but it, there are some downsides to it is that uh, televisit, you can't always do a physical exam, so you might miss out on some things, but uh, at least it does provide more access to people. So I think uh, refining televisits is going to be helpful. Other possible solutions are moving outside of the clinic. Clinic has always uh, uh, been problematic for underserved populations. There's mistrust, there's fear, there's lack of insurance, there's stigma. There's myriad reasons why people won't want to go to a clinic. So the possibility of screening people for sexually transmitted infections uh, outside of the clinic will be very helpful. And we saw that this in HIV, and it was very successful. You know, there was lots of, it was uh, launched with much trepidation. People were concerned that people may not access care. They were concerned that it wouldn't get reported, so it wouldn't be included in surveillance. And these are all issues that still need to be worked out, but it does provide an opportunity. So home testing and point of care testing. Point of care testing is a great because it can really reduce the time that a person uh, must wait to get their results. And so that can, uh, can uh, help be very helpful. So, um, Point of care tests versus laboratory tests. So laboratory tests, usually you have to send it out. It may take a couple of days. If it's a point of care test, you usually can get it in a much reduced time frame, which will have lots of advantages. Um, clinic versus home test. Clinic is uh, clinic best uh, testing is uh, um, optimal because you can also engage with a uh, physical examination and you can um, actually see the person. Um, so home testing is not as great for that, but it's really great for access to care. So some people that may not, wouldn't traditionally go to clinic. 
Also, clear wave versus non clear wave. If uh, some of these tests uh, require instrumentation, some of them require to be certified for CLIA, um, and some of them, uh, so there, there's some issues with some of these. There's a, a plethora of um, point of care testing that is out there, and many of them are they, some of them take 10 minutes, some of them take 90 minutes, some of them require specific instrumentation, some of them are on their own. Um, and so there are all sorts of different uh, varieties of this, and we're gonna see more and more point of care tests uh, uh, being introduced for all of the sexually transmitted infections. So the advantage of these point of care tests is they're very uh, uh, predict, or they're very uh, accurate, sensitive and specific. They allow for a quicker diagnosis. They re reduce the participant burden so they don't have to go in, uh, maybe wait for a very long time at the clinic or maybe come back for a visit if they are found to be positive and they've already left the clinic. So that can reduce that. It can also help with uh, better uh, antibiotic stewardship. So you will not necessarily uh, be uh, treated in a uh, syndromic manner. Rather, you can use uh, a real test to do that. And so that would have would be a very important uh, initiative. The disadvantages, they're, they're quite expensive. In fact, for the most part, they are more expensive than laboratory-based. Not all are, as I mentioned before, CLIA waived. And so that means that there may be some other regulations that you, they have to be stored certain ways. They have to be, um, they can't be, they can't travel out into the field. Some of them can, and some of them cannot. Uh, you can't test for all sexually transmitted infections. Some of them have a lot of uh, panels on them and some of them don't. They may miss other STIs if no physical examination is, is done. Um, and also many of the point of care tests are not reported. So unless there's something like a Bluetooth device or some other mechanism, um, that uh, they may not be reported. And so that would not figure into surveillance. We didn't see that so much as an issue with HIV testing, but if it becomes more of our mainstay for STI testing, it could. So that needs to be worked out. And then there can be omissions in reporting and billing. And so, for example, sometimes people don't get reimbursed for their home test, and that can be very costly. So a person, if they went to the clinic, they just pay a copay, but now they're paying for the full test. And that could be very uh, expensive unless uh, insurance would cover it. So this is what the gold standard for point of care test in my mind would look like. It would be rapid. Um, it would be definitely point of care. It could be done at the home or in the clinic or anywhere out in the field. Um, and also the results are reported to the local jurisdictions that require that reporting, such as um, local offices of public health and eventually the CDC. So uh, if we can move towards this, this would be great. So moving outside of the clinic, um, one of the first initiatives ever done was I Want the Kit. This is done in Baltimore. It was started in Baltimore and now it uh, serves all of Maryland and they just moved to uh, Alaska. So there's some areas where you can just simply sign up. You get a kit, they send it to you. If you're positive, they give you the results. You can bring that into your provider and get cared for. So this has been very effective. And um, Dr. Charlotte Gatos and her group have really published a lot on this. And it's really quite, um, it was quite, uh, uh, avant-garde for the time. Um, and so I mentioned you do have to have internet access. So there are some people that may not have that. You do also have to have the will or the want. You have to desire to be uh, tested. And some people don't have that. They don't know that they have to be tested. There is another initiative called Get Yourself Tested, which is um, it was an initiative by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I believe it was in, in partnership with MTV and some other groups where they had really great uh, advertisement for it. And um, it was promoted greatly on uh, STD week, which is in April. And they got a lot of people tested. They you know, disseminated it to high schools and colleges and other areas. So our, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our, which is in non-traditional venues. Um, we, had, um, uh, we have just for the last five years been embarking upon the Check It program. Check It is a community-based screening. The goal of Check It was to, uh, as you know, CDC does not recommend screening women men for chlamydia or gonorrhea. They do recommend screening young sexually active women under the age of 25, um, and so they, but they don't have these recommendations for men. So we wanted to determine if um, men, uh, screening men could have any impact on women. So we um, engaged, uh, we enlisted about 50 partners. Many of them were from recreational facilities, historically black colleges and universities, training facilities, uh, we did barbershops um, and historically black owned 
communities. And we were focusing on African-American young men because they're nine times more likely to have chlamydia than their white counterparts. We also focused in on New Orleans because it was a predominantly black city. So, um, and I happened to live there, so that helped. But anyway, um, it is, uh, this is, uh, we engaged on this in this, um, and so to be enrolled in the study, you had to be 15 to 26 years of age. We started at 24 and then we found out the guys were having sex with uh, younger women. So we um, elongated the age to 26. They had to be black or African-American. They had to have a penis and they had to live uh, or spend most of their time in, in, in New Orleans proper. And they had to have had sex with a woman at least once. So we were focusing on men who have sex with women they could have had sex with men too, about 7% of them did. But because we know a lot about home testing for gay men or gay bisexual men, but what we don't know is for the men who have sex with women. So that's why we decided to focus in on, and those are the men that are giving the infection to the women. So they got free testing. They also got incentivized testing. They got $25 for being in the study. Um, they could use that towards money for a visa card or they could get their hair cut for free with that $25, whatever they wanted. Um, we also, if they were positive, we gave them medication. Um, we gave medication for themselves and any sex partner that they um, gave us information on, we gave them the medication to bring to that sex partner. We also retested them in three months if they were positive and we referred them uh, anytime that they were positive. We also referred them to go get a full battery of sexually trans, uh, 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 an STI examination because we figured once you have one STI, you're probably more likely to get, have other STIs. So it was easy. They just gave a urine specimen. They engaged in a little survey on their phone. If they were positive, they could go to one of the pharmacies. Mostly they were Walgreens, but we did have one local pharmacy. And um, then they would get the medicine for themselves and their partners. And, it, um, and so it was a simple, but quite bundled intervention. And it really kind of hit on expedited partner treatment and screening and all that. So I think that, um, that uh, um, now I want to say, tell you about, did it work or not? So what we found is, yes, indeed, we were able to screen over 2,600 men. Um, and the in, infection rate for chlamydia was about uh, 11%. And for uh, gonorrhea, it was just shy of 2%. Uh, we uh, published that in STD. Um, we also looked to see, did it affect any change in the rate in women? And as you can see, the dotted line is for our control sites that didn't have check it. And the uh, non-dashed line or the solid line is for the check it site. And you can see it was statistically significantly lower, the rates in women um, uh, for those who were uh, women who were living in the check it area. You can see our mathematical modeling on the bottom right-hand side. When we started the intervention, you could see after about uh, um, a year or so, possibly two years, you started to see a reduction in the rates, not just in men, because we were screening them, but also in women. And so this is mathematical modeling that we did, and we found that it did have an effect on women. So we see that through the Medicaid data up, up on the top, and then through the mathematical modeling. We also did a cost-effectiveness study and found that it was cost-effective, um, that it, uh, the cost of the intervention was minimal compared to the qualities that um, were gained. So in summary, STI care is likely to change forever. It was moving that way anyway, but this really propelled it into uh, a faster mode. Uh, we're gonna see more and more home testing, more and more point of care testing is gonna be available. And in order to uh, survive structural shock. So I live in a hurricane vulnerable area. Some people live in fire area, vulnerable areas, COVID hit everybody. Um, so there are going to probably, unfortunately, be more structural shocks uh, with climate change and, and everything. And so this could serve as a way to help us serve our clientele um, in, in the face of these structural shocks. And also, it's a great way to reduce health disparities. STIs are notorious for health disparities. Just about every single one of them uh, cause it, it, it has, it demonstrates uh, that um, usually persons of color are more likely to get the STIs. So this could be another way of reducing those health disparities. And so more and more non-clinic-based options are needed. And it is my hope that Check It could serve as one of those models uh, for it. Thank you very much for your attention. And Thank you, Patty. And now we'll hear from David Pride. Hello. 
Thank you so much for attending today. I am Dr. Pride. I'm the director of the Microbiology Laboratory at UC San Diego Health. And I and my colleagues today are gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about sexually transmitted infections uh, during times of COVID. Specifically, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about testing challenges that we encountered uh, during the times of COVID and how that may very well have contributed to some of the more global uh, epidemiological trends that we're observing uh, in sexually transmitted infections. So I've got a few goals for this webinar. Um, the first is to really provide an overview of some of the things that happen with uh, sexually transmitted infection testing, particularly during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to identify some of the trends that really had an impact upon testing, uh, particularly things like consumables and the availability of staffing uh, during the pandemic. We want to discuss what the lack of testing potentially means, uh, particularly for patients, uh, as well as trends in sexually transmitted uh, infections, and to end talking a little bit about some potentially long-lasting trends uh, that we've observed with things like, for example, home testing uh, for sexually transmitted uh, infections. So a little bit about the role of the clinical lab in sexually transmitted uh, infection testing. It's probably a bit overlooked, um, and it, while in general it might not always be overlooked, particularly during the times of COVID, uh, I, I think uh, uh, it got overlooked quite a bit. And part of that uh, really has to do with the fact that all of our energy really went to developing testing for COVID-19 so that we could respond to the global pandemic. One of the things that was really in the background the entire time is whether or not we can perform all of the other testing that a clinical microbiology laboratory would normally perform uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for example, my individual laboratory performs over a hundred different tests. And while we put all, almost all of our energy into developing single tests just for COVID, one of the big question marks was, can we continue to perform those other hundred tests really in the face of what's going on uh, right now? And that was a really big problem, not just for our laboratory, but for really laboratories uh, across the world. The demand uh, for some of these sexually transmitted infections um, uh, did go down, uh, as which we will talk about, uh, but it, it, it decreased really for a myriad of reasons. Um, one is that we had a lot less people who were seeing their physicians at the time, and a large part of that was just fear, uh, perhaps on both the part of the physician, as well as that the individuals uh, for contracting uh, COVID. Um, the uh, unfortunate circumstances usually that led people to uh, uh, seek out sexually uh, transmitted infection testing, all of those things really remain. Um, it's just that we were doing a lot less testing uh, during that period of time. So laboratories like ours really had to figure out, well, how do we prioritize all of this over testing, uh, all of this other type of testing where the real priority right now is how do we provide COVID testing to respond to the pandemic. So a laboratory like ours performs a lot of different uh, tests for sexually transmitted infections. And while this is not a comprehensive list, um, these are some of the things that we would normally test for. So for example, we test for chlamydia trachomatis, um, Neisseria gonorrhea. We test for syphilis. We test for HIV. We test for hepatitis B, hepatitis C. We test for human papillomavirus. We also test for herpes simplex viruses, type one and type two. What we observed uh, during the pandemic uh, were uh, really some significant decreases in the amount of testing uh, that we were performing. And the, the one thing I, I want you to keep in mind is that we perform all the tests that are sent to us. Um, so if there's less tests, it's not because we, uh, we wanted to perform less tests, it's because less 
tests were sent to us largely because less physicians were ordering tests, probably because less people were coming to them uh, to uh, seek uh, clinical care. So our uh, testing volumes uh, decreased uh, uh, in the period of 2020. Remember the pandemic uh, started late 2019, uh, started to become really apparent probably around March of 2020. Um, and uh, um, we've been in this pandemic really since then. Um, so most of the decreases in testing that we observe uh, are uh, fairly specific to the year uh, 2020. And as you can see here, we performed less tests for gonorrhea and chlamydia, less tests for HIV, less tests for hepatitis B, less tests for syphilis, uh, less tests for human papillomavirus, and we also uh, uh, believe we performed less tests for herpes simplex virus. And while 2020 was an increase, if you look at 2021 compared to 2019, we were performing about double the number of tests uh, uh, in that uh, uh, between that uh, time period. And we believe that uh, in a, uh, to a large extent uh, that in the year 2020, while we did see a slight increase increase in testing, um, that uh, increase in testing is not nearly uh, the increase that we would have observed had there not uh, been a pandemic. So just overall in our laboratory, what we're still observing are, are increases in tests over time now, um, anywhere between 20 to 30 percent for most of these uh, uh, tests, but they were significantly decreased, uh, particularly right around March of 2020. Again, there are a multitude of factors that are involved in uh, impacting uh, this testing. The hesitancy for in-person uh, visits uh, we sort of touched upon, um, but a lot of it really has to do with um, growing pains from developing the idea of virtual visits. Many institutions didn't have, you know, uh, basically uh, an internet type of visit that you could have uh, with your patients. Uh, and uh, many institutions like our own started those sorts of visits. Unfortunately, one of the things you can uh, or figure out from that is that you kind of need an internet connection to have a virtual visit. Uh, so uh, a large number of patients, in essence, were kind of shut out uh, from clinical care uh, because of the uh, move to uh, virtual visits. The availability of testing really wasn't something that was widely publicized. It wasn't widely publicized because uh, it was so widely publicized that there were deficits or deficiencies in COVID testing that most people weren't really thinking that much about, well, what's going on with uh, sexually transmitted infection testing? Um, and one of the uh, uh, things that really was occurring, as, as you can imagine, is that uh, as manufacturers were trying to ramp up uh, their uh, consumables uh, so that they could supply laboratories like ours with COVID testing, because, for example, they didn't have a bunch of additional factories so that they could just uh, bring more and more and more consumables uh, to the market, uh, what tended to happen was that they would shift um, their current manufacturing from one thing to something else. Uh, and one of the things that uh, they shifted from were sexually transmitted infection uh, consumables. Um, so we had a significant deficit in the number of uh, sexually transmitted uh, infection uh, consumables than we would normally have uh, throughout uh, that time period. You can see over time, uh, particularly again, right around March of 2020, um, that uh, you know doctor visits were significantly uh, impacted compared, for example, uh, to the same time uh, in 2019. And those uh, doc in-person doctor visits really still have not gone back uh, to 100%. Uh, and, and that's just largely because the virus continues to be around, but also because institutions uh, really have decided that virtual visits 
uh, are probably a, a, a thing to use in the future uh, as well. So that um, if you look, for example, at what's going on in uh, the UK, because they track their, uh, uh, their patient visits really, really closely, um, you can see that in the year 2020, they started having either telephone or these sort of uh, not in person virtual uh, visits. Uh, and um, they those continue throughout 2020 at our institution. They're continuing all the way to 2022. And we view them really as a staple of our clinical care uh, in the uh, uh, future as well. One of the other things that we saw, uh, particularly right around 2020, was an impact on people getting vaccinated. For example, human papillomavirus is a disease of which there is a vaccination available for some wart-causing viruses, uh, as well as some uh, cancer-associated viruses. And we saw those uh, really plummet uh, uh, in 2020. Again, a casualty of having a pandemic with a lot less in-person uh, doctor visits. Uh, so at some point we might uh, very well uh, see a, a reciprocal sort of increase in HPV infections as a result of the fact that there are less um, HPV vaccinations taking place during that time period. Of course, we saw a lot less um, uh, test for uh, bacterial sec uh, sexually transmitted infections like chlamydia, like gonorrhea, and like syphilis. And one of the things that we have observed is, in, in essence, a rebound. So while we saw a significant decrease, uh, again, the decrease uh, does not necessarily mean that people didn't need to be tested. Um, in other words, uh, the, uh, one, and one of the toughest things about uh, the decrease is that if disease is still there, then people are probably still spreading the disease. So we have seen significant increases uh, in sexually transmitted infections now that we are uh, back to testing about 100% of what we were uh, before. In fact, uh, again, at my institution, we're testing about 120% of what we were before, and we're seeing really high rates uh, of disease in California, where I am, uh, we uh, noted, uh, particularly during that year 2020, uh, we, we saw less uh, uh, tests for chlamydia, less tests for gonorrhea, uh, about 30% uh, less tests for HIV, uh, about 25% less tests for syphilis as well. Again, these diseases did not go away. It's just that testing for them uh, significantly was impacted by the pandemic. So uh, uh, unfortunately, we could see reciprocal increases uh, in those uh, uh, diseases, largely because they were still there. They just were not being diagnosed uh, at the time. So lots of people, lots of parts of the country were impacted by the reduced testing that we saw uh, in the pandemic. Not every region was affected uh, equally as you guys uh, can kind of see by this sort of snapshot, um, uh, looking at uh, uh, some testing volumes where the Northeast was a little different from the West, was a little different uh, from the Southeast. Um, but the take home message really is everyone was impact, whether it impacted, whether it was equally or not. Uh, entire institutions were impacted. There were clear winners and unfortunately clear losers uh, in the uh, quest really to garner testing consumables uh, so that you could test your patient populations uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, larger facilities tended to do better than smaller facilities, uh, for example. As you guys will hear a bit more about uh, in this hour, uh, in particular uh, minorities, underserved communities, uh, rural communities uh, were impacted uh, really significantly uh, by the, uh, the lack of testing uh, that, uh, that was available. One of the big things that led to some of the lack of testing um, uh, is were consumable shortages. As we mentioned, companies had to shift their manufacturing. And we just looked at a survey, uh, basically, of microbiology laboratories. And the one thing that probably really jumps out is the uh, significant deficit that most laboratories had 
and uh, their ability to test for sexually transmitted infections. Uh, I really think it was uh, for our institution, it was just lucky that we didn't receive the normal number of tests that we would because we would not have been able to perform all of those tests because we simply didn't have the consumables uh, to do so. And all around the country, it's the same story. Most labs didn't have the consumables uh, to be able to test all of those patients. And uh, uh, of course, that, that has a sort of wide ranging uh, uh, reach here um, that could have a number of different impacts uh, on patient populations, because certainly there were institutions where they just couldn't uh, test people who showed up to be tested. At our institution, we could, but that, as I mentioned earlier, that's probably just luck. The other thing that really impacted uh, is staffing shortages. We had significant staffing shortages all around the country. And one, uh, one of the uh, responses that the government had was to allow laboratories like ours to use unlicensed personnel to perform uh, some of the testing. And that was absolutely necessary to be able to make it through at least the earlier uh, parts of this pandemic. Part of that is because we have CLS as clinical laboratory scientists um, who are superbly trained to perform these tests, but they are a bit of an aging group that, uh, um, and we're seeing significant declines as uh, the group is retiring. Uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing a bunch of graduates who are replacing them. Um, so this sort of work, work shortage that was in a lot of ways accelerated by the pandemic is something that's going to continue uh, really into the future. Other things that impact uh, uh, laboratories, of course, laboratories made a lot of investments in equipment, um, and that will affect some of their testing moving forward because a lot of institutions are gonna try to use that equipment so that they can recoup their large investments. Clear wave tests um, are kind of a thing of the present, but certainly more of a thing of the future. And what that means basically is that some of these relatively sophisticated tests will be able to be run right in your doctor's office, for example, uh, and not require that your doctor send the test to a laboratory like ours uh, to be tested. Um, imagine your patients being able to come to your office, get a test right there in your office and be provided with the result before they go home. So that is a trend uh, that is kind of here now, uh, but certainly a wave of the future. Another wave of the future is the idea of at home testing uh, and at home testing, we sort of seen start to uh, to expand. Uh, a large part of the expansion was probably due to the pandemic, and there are a lot of places um, uh, that are starting to offer this, and they're offering it even without a uh, an individual doctor's visit, where uh, for an individual can swab themselves or provide urine uh, in a cup uh, and be tested for a myriad of different. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So these are things that are all sort of coming in our armamentarium uh, to help sort of battle the crisis that is the increase in sexually uh, transmitted infections. So with that uh, broad overview of some of the challenges that we've had uh, to uh, sexually transmitted infections during times of this uh, pandemic, I will turn it over to my colleagues who will talk a bit more about some of these uh, sexually transmitted infections and their challenges. Thank you. Thank you again, Casey, Patty, and David for your time today and your important research. We'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is for Patty. Do you think that COVID-19 pandemic has increased or decreased STI rates? Thanks for that question. Um, it, that is a complicated question and uh, it's partially because it's unknowable. With our, our surveillance system right now is imperfect. We, are, we base all of our surveillance on case rates. So case rates come from people who are tested and are 
found to be positive, and the denominator is the census. And this is generally done throughout the world. So um, what happens with that is we don't really know. So if less people get tested, you have less uh, uh, in the numerator. And so you can't really know. Um, so I think that um, uh, we're going to probably see a big surge um, because many people who are asymptomatic didn't get tested. Even some of those who were symptomatic couldn't get in to get tested. So we will see a surge. And um, I don't know how long it will take for that to surge to quell. But um, I don't know if my other colleagues have anything else to say about that. Our next question, how long do you think it will take for STI rates to recover from the pandemic? So I can take this one and kind of just segue off the last question that Patty had. Um, <sighs> we don't know right and we just saw the newest cdc guidelines come or the newest cdc statistics good lord it's a day come out that shows that chlamydia is has actually decreased from the previous year and this all while all the other stis have increased um and what all we can say is exactly what patty said you know we don't actually have a denominator here we don't know how many people are getting tested and we know that chlamydia is often found in patients who are going in for asymptomatic screening, and we know that that's decreased. So I do not think our rates have recovered yet. I think we're gonna see a spike with chlamydia over the next year, and I wouldn't be surprised if gonorrhea and syphilis keep rising, but these are all theories, um, and only time will tell what actually does happen. Next question, how do you think televisits will affect STI care? I can also take this one if no one else wants to. Um, I think that televisits are fantastic. I think they are going to drastically increase access, especially to populations who don't have that access, like your rural populations or your LGBT health populations. Um, but I also think that televisits are gonna hinder care. So patients who just use these for convenience, who do have access to clinics, may not be getting the right antibiotics that they need because we can't prescribe you an injection over the phone. Um, you actually have to come into a clinic site to get that. Um, and it's also gonna impact surveillance data and how much we're actually getting reported from all of these tests. All right, thank you. Uh, this next question is for David. Is STI testing now readily available as it was pre-pandemic? Yeah, uh, well, uh, so STI testing has been able to increase. Uh, most of the companies that are producing the consumables for STI tests really have ramped up significantly. So at an institution like ours and academic institutions, they are readily and freely available the way that they used to be. Um, so I think on the whole, uh, we're probably back to where we need to be. That doesn't mean that every single institution across the country has the access that they need right now, uh, but certainly um, the number of tests that we have available to us now are greater than they were pre-pandemic. -pre can I just add something to that, um, Davey, that that's uh, really important what you pointed out. Uh, another thing to say is that our STI testing even before COVID was not very good. Um, first of all, if you're a young person who thinks you might have an STI and you're beholden to your parents for insurance and to bring you to a clinic and you don't wanna tell your parents, you're not gonna go get tested. It was very imperfect. And also uh, primary care doctors should be testing Anybody who's sexually active, particularly, well, women right now, but I hopefully they'll move towards men as well, they should be testing them and it, that doesn't always happen. And so I think that even though, even if we rebound back to where we were pre-COVID, it wasn't adequate. All right, thank you. Next question. In India, due to absence of any formal adolescent adult sex education, hygiene, safe sex, and STI prevention education, and on the other hand, with, mo with almost universal access to internet porn, STI situation is very dire. Governments and education boards are apathetic or embarrassed. What are the panel's remedial suggestions? 
I can take that. Uh, I could start it off, and I'm sure everybody here, uh, the other panelists, have uh, comments. But I'll just say because I live in the Delta, south of uh, the United States, it's very conservative here. And I would say, well, it's maybe not quite as conservative as India, but it's very conservative. And so we have the same uh, issues. Sex education is sporadic. It's uh, disjointed, and it's definitely not comprehensive in many parts of the United States. So my suggestions are just keep fighting the good fight, keep bringing it to the fore, keep letting people know about it, let your legislators know about it, let, you know, do everything you can to raise awareness because the public needs to be aware of this and, and they don't want to be because it's, it's a kind of a topic people don't want to talk about. And I'm sure others have things to say about it. Yeah, I've actually done some work in India, not in STIs specifically, but I think that the nice thing in India is that pharmacies are open. Like you can come up and just ask for a prescription. So these point of care tests that we're really pushing for since COVID hit, well, before COVID, but now that it hit, they're really coming to the market. I think that's going to be your key and putting out education online to the people who are accessing the porn sites through those porn sites, through other um, avenues so that they can, so they know and they can get themselves tested and then subsequently can get themselves the treatment, which is not as easy to do in the U.S. You kind of have to circumvent the government a little bit in India to get this done, though, because they're never going to push it through. Um, this next question is for Patty. Really excellent and exciting work in the Check It program. What else do you think is needed in order to shift the CDC guidelines to more broadly encompass all sexually active people as opposed to the current focus on MSM and young women? Thank you for that great question. Thank you for the compliment. Yes, we really uh, have enjoyed working in the Check It program. I think the, I, I feel very sorry for CDC right now. They're, they're, they're being pulled in so many different directions and with very few resources. We have a very fragile STI infrastructure here in the United States. And I think you could say that of many places. Um, and I think that without the, um, uh, without more resources and funding, it may be difficult for them. So what they've done is you focus in on the persons who have the highest prevalence, which of course is men who have sex with men and um, young women. But, but men, as you could see in our Check It program, they were all, African-American and they all lived in this deep South, but they had really high rates. So I think we need to figure out the pockets of where the folks are that have high rates and you have to turn over stones because we like, I don't know that people even studied uh, young black men before. And so I think that uh, we young black heterosexual or, or uh, men who have sex with women. So I think just um, uh, uh, giving, getting more resources to the CDC and making sure, and, and will they change the guidelines? I was on the consultation in 2007 and they said the reason that they didn't do it is because they didn't have data and they didn't know about feasibility. Well, now with Check It, we provided them with the data and we've provided them with the feasibility. And I didn't really get that many, I'm not getting that much interest in it. So I need more and more people to be interested in this. Maybe people reproduce our study in other areas. I'm happy to help if anybody wants to. But I think that uh, we really, there is room, we do need to take care of our uh, young people who don't, who aren't covered in these areas. Thanks. All right, thank you. Next question. Is it better to multiplex these tests? Uh, so, uh, you know, um, it it is good to multiplex some tests. Uh, I have to admit, you know, if you were to ask 10 different physicians uh, the answer to this question. You may very well get 10 different answers, unfortunately. The one thing I can say that we do do is that we monitor physician behavior when it comes to, say, a single plex test versus a multiplex test, um, because we constantly do get physicians who will tell you they only want a single plex test. I quite frankly, I'm one of them sometimes who's saying that the exact same thing. But what we find is that if you can offer a multiplex test at a reasonable cost um, and get results to physicians quickly, usually that's going to be the one they choose, regardless of, quite frankly, whether they tell you that's the one they want or not. All right. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Do you feel the development of NAAT and point of care will increase the diversity in testing market or funnel it? 
Um, well, you, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, mo most people really do feel like um, adding uh, point of care testing is really important because it uh, just increases the number of different populations and the uh, diversity of the populations that are capable, uh, in essence, of being tested. So uh, there really is a critical need to develop high quality point of care testing um, uh, to, to really uh, uh, to be able to meet the needs of our patient populations. Ideally, they would be nucleic acid amplification tests, as uh, you're sort of pointing out. Uh, particularly right now, the standard of care for gonorrhea and chlamydia is nucleic acid amplification tests. So uh, if there can be point of care tests that do a really good job and are cost effective at doing that, uh, then absolutely it's going to meet uh, really a critical need for the population. Can I just add one thing, though? As I mentioned before, um, you can't. It's great to have this diversity of tests, and I applaud it. And I hope we continue to produce more and more. But you have to also stimulate the interest in this. For example, if I'm a young person that has chlamydia, I'm asymptomatic. What's go, what's prompting me to go get tested? So if it's if it we're relying on home tests, you, the assumption is that the populace understands that they need to be tested. So it can't be done in an isolation. We really need to have in tandem with uh, uh, education programs and awareness, raising awareness in the population. All right. Well, thank you again, Casey, Patty, and David, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Roach Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone and goodbye.